Nadia and I met, uh, we, we just uh, discovered that we met seven years ago when she was speaking at my first TEDx Klagenfurt event and we haven't spoken since. We've <laughs> always been in touch and we talked uh, via Facebook and other tools, but we haven't seen each other. We haven't actually talked. talked to each other. Exactly. So that's amazing. I'm, I'm super happy to have you here. Um, Nadia is the reinvention officer. Uh, mm -hmm. She lives in the United States in Columbus, Ohio, originally from Kazakhstan. Um, Nadia is an author, educator, business owner. She's written, please correct me, three books so far on strategy. Working on my fourth one. Okay, currently working on her uh, fourth one. And um, the, the title of her webinar today is How to Turn Fear into Productive Action, um, which is, a, I think, a very, very relevant topic in the times of Corona. So Nadia, I'm super... Uh, looking forward to your webinar, to your insights, to your input, and the stage is yours, enjoy. Thank you so much, thank you. Welcome everyone, happy to be with the Pirates. I, I always remember the words um, of some of the amazing thinkers in the world on um, why wouldn't you be a pirate? This is much more exciting life, so happy to be with all of you. Um, before we get going and I put my slides up, which I have very few of, and before I give you a workbook to actually do an exercise with me on turning fear into action, I want to ask you in the chat area to help me understand, to help us all land here and check in. And by the way, as you are writing, if you can switch from all panelists, I don't know what it is in German, to all panelists and attendees so everyone can hear your answers and answer also and um, see your comments. So the little blue bar, make sure that you're not just writing to me and Marco, with, um, I'm sure you want everyone else to see. So here's a question for you. Give me three words that describe how you experienced in the last couple of months. So three words, uh, this will be a way to check in, to land together, to, to really get the feeling of us together. So give me three words in the chat area that for you reflect the last couple of months. Uh, it can be positive, negative words, really doesn't matter. It's more of understanding how you're doing, how you're feeling and so on. And by the way, I know I'm speaking English and I don't know um, German, unfortunately, but if there is a German word that better describes what you're feeling, that's also fine. Make sure you switch from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. So Moonshot Pirates said, intense, busy, exciting. Leonardo wrote just to me, but said anxiety. And Sabine said also just to me, slow, relaxing, and energizing. You see what a big, big range it is from slow, relaxing, to intense, to anxiety. And all of it is a soup. Anybody else? Give me three words just as a way to connect. Sophie says, fear about the future, curiosity, a lot of work. I think that's true for a lot of us. Suddenly, I know for sure I'm working more than I did before the quarantine started. Here in Ohio, official day of quarantine was March 11th. So we are almost in two months of isolation. And now family, we started isolation on March 10th. And uh, it's going to be two months next week. Okay, uh, anybody else? Give me three words somehow that reflect where you are right now. Free time, work, sports, interesting, coming, hate. What a big mix, absolutely. Anxious, spiritual, happier in the end. Yeah, it's a progression. It comes also in stages and many times it's a linear. Our emotional reaction to something is not always linear. So let me share uh, this uh, presentation with you. And I don't know if you can see me, maybe Marco, you need to switch the video so that uh, we can keep going with me. Not sure how to do that. Maybe like that. Yeah, I, I, I changed or switched the, the view so they see first you and in a little picture. Right. Uh, Excellent. So um, the idea that we have for today is to give you an actual exercise. And this exercise is not something you do only once in your life. Uh, fear and any kind of emotional response is very similar to the way we experience anything else in life and any um, 
repetitive movement it's like taking a shower you need to refresh yourself on a regular basis so i invite you to use this exercise not only in this particular situation but do it on a regular basis every time you have a strong emotion fear anger uh, this exercise will work very well but before we do that uh, we already started getting to know each other i want to hear one more answer to how you experience in this crisis because we all experience covid 19 uh, in very different ways, and we joined this webinar for different reasons. So in the comments, if you can give me in numbers, if your COVID-19 reality looks like you know, some discomfort, but generally very well manageable, give me a one in the comments. If you feel like there are some serious troubles, maybe your life got seriously disrupted, maybe you're in school and you had to leave the university or something else, but you're making it through it to two, and if there is like a real collapse, maybe you, some of you were doing a startup and you had to freeze, maybe you had a job and now you cannot perform your duties, that would be a three and it can be anywhere in between as well. So Kara and Sophia both ones, I see Sabine also writing to me as one, Celine is one, two, Elizabeth is one, Joanna is 1.5, yeah, some, somebody is probably in 0 0.5 and um, some is one, Milita is one, and Ella is one, uh, Pauline, many of you are one. Great. So this is good news because I work mainly with businesses, including business owners and startup um, owners, people who just recently started a business. And I just did this uh, a question for a group of 450 uh, business owners. And they were mainly in two, threes, or even fours and fives. Many of them who own businesses with direct interaction with customers actually are in complete free fall. So I'm very happy to see that most of you are between one and two, which is a good news. Well, from uh, my point of view, uh, it's all about whatever your situation is, is to help you see this reality in a different way and also see how we can help you to give you tools to break through in this particular case or any other case. And from my point of view, uh, just so you know why I am here, I am a recovering academic. As, uh, as it was already mentioned, I write books and teach, but also I do uh, own a group of companies. So about 13 years ago, I left academia and chaired professorship to start my own business, which grew into a group of businesses. And in my own life, what we do the most is that we work with large companies in the middle of uh, some sort of transition, transformation or crisis, partnering often with very big consulting companies or smaller organizations to help uh, recover, reinvent and rethink business products, models, uh, start new startups, so very often we'll help existing legacy businesses start a venture fund and uh, begin to develop new directions. So as you can imagine, a lot of our clients are living through serious fear and serious danger. And the exercise I'll share today, we developed for them in March so that they can um, help themselves and also lead their teams and coach their teams through the fear. So what started the development of this exercise is, of course, the coronavirus um, changes. It first was small disruption, finally a complete global transformation that is happening. And the first thing that I want to share with you, I want to scare you or possibly open up your mind. Um, a very good friend of mine, a professor with whom I used to teach a lot, uh, Dr. J.B. Kansargent, who teaches at uh, Harvard and now teaches at Babson College, the best entrepreneurship school in the world. He always tells me, Nadia, facts are friendly. Facts are friendly. Facts are not there to attack you or scare you or punish you. They're friendly. So I want to give you a perspective. Facts are friendly. Right now, a lot of us are reacting to COVID-19. The reality is, of course, this is just one of many, many disruptions that have been happening and will continue to happen. And unfortunately for you, uh, as you are still in the early stages of your life and career, unfortunately, they will keep happening for you more than they had to happen for me. Um, even though I lived through a collapse of a country, I lived in three different continents and uh, seen a lot of disruption in my life, still for you, as it is for my daughter, who is 16, this will be a much more intense reality. Why? 
well, you all know that there are global think tanks all over the world, and one of them is World Economic Forum. I belong to a number of think tanks, and we all track different disruptions that are happening. And in the global map of risks and disruptions, everything that is shaking the world, there are many different things that we pay attention to. So this is a 2019 map from World Economic Forum. And as you can see in the bottom, the horizontal axis, measures the likelihood of that disruption to materialize and the vertical axis measures potential impact on our human civilization from zero to 4.5 or 4. And if you were to see every different disruption, so you see what is happening here, uh, we have extreme weather events, we have water crisis, we have involuntary migration, we have interstate conflicts, so wars, we have acid bubbles, that was the source of 2018 global economic crisis. If you were to guess where is coronavirus on this map, which as I said was 2019 map, well, it's not really very high. It's right here, spread of infectious diseases. So generally speaking, not only we anticipated this particular risk, but we don't even in a global intellectual space, don't even consider it that big of a thing. What can really disrupt the world and what's more likely to happen is things that are happening on a regular basis. So all of the things you see in the right part of this chart is happening, it's just like any other future is unevenly distributed. Remember the famous quote, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Disruption is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Just like coronavirus is also unevenly distributed, different countries experience differently. The impact on different industries, on different age groups, on different realities is quite unevenly distributed. So I don't wanna scare the heck out of you, but I do want us to be very sober and honest with what kind of world we'll live in. It's the world where disruption is normal. And this is the term I'm sure you all know, the name for this world that we've been using for the last 15, 20 years, 15 or so. This is a name that comes from military, originally developed to describe the Iraq war as a new reality, the new normal. VUCA world stands for four words, volatile, so it's a world where up and down happens very quickly. If you see it the last five years on the prices of oil going from uh, up and down all the way to hundreds of dollars to now in negative prices or zero, it's a time of uncertainty where no expert in the world can tell you what will happen. And if they are telling you what will happen, they are lying. So we will all have to be on the lookout for those who know the answer. It's the time of complexity when everything impacts everything else. And it's also a time of ambiguity. Ambiguity means that the same exact data can be interpreted in more than one way and often contradictory to each other. So the VUCA world is here, but we as a collective humanity are pretending that it's not. How do I know that? Well, if you look at the data, unfortunately, most organizations around the world are not able to survive in this VUCA world. For example, from the original Fortune 500 list, the entire 500 companies, 88% of those companies have already disappeared. It took them 60 years to disappear, but even before coronavirus, the prediction was 50% of all standards and poor companies will be gone by year 2027. And that number is probably higher, so more than 50%. And the time horizon is probably shorter. Probably more companies will die because of coronavirus. So they, we won't need to wait until 2027. We also see that it's harder for us, those of you who are already in jobs uh, and those of you who are starting and working on your own startup, maybe thinking about that Silicon Valley challenge that Moonshot Pirates are running, you know that uh, before you would reach the peak of the summit and you will stay as an industry leader, as a uh, particular area leader for many, many years, 77% of companies, when they reach the peak, would stay there for five years or more. Now it's just 44% of companies. Even when you reach the peak, you still fall off that throne, like Game of Thrones, very, very quickly.
And unfortunately, most organizations, most individuals, and also most communities, talking about the local community. Um, I used to live in Northern Slovenia in Black. I would come to Austria almost on a weekly basis, had a lot of work to do also in Vienna, but not just Vienna, in Fila and Klagenfurt. Sometimes it's not just a company, it's a community, and the communities are not doing very well. So if you look at the global statistics on how many transformations and reinventions succeed, it's actually about one quarter. We are, as humanity, not very good at reinvention. And right now, the surprising number that I want to give you, not only for this moment, but for your entire future career, indeed, any crisis brings organizations or individual careers down. So those of you who maybe have internships or jobs, it's very possible that there is a shakeup there. And in the past crises, absolutely a large number of companies, more specifically 17% of companies did not survive. But much more interesting number is this one. 9% of companies not just survived, they thrived. They did very, very well. So the question for me and you is how can we all be in that 9%? Whether we talk about ourselves as a employees or startupers or just talking about our personal life and our well-being, can we be in the 9%? And to be in that 9%, we have to reframe our question. So a lot of questions I get from businesses and from individuals is, how do we make it until things stabilize and go back to normal? How can we survive until things are finally back to normal? The reality is there will be no back to normal. If you remember that chart I just showed you, the crazy disruption chart, if it's not COVID-19, it's something else that will disrupt us. So it's not going to be back to normal. Then the question really is not how do we wait and survive to make a no to make it to back to normal, but how can we thrive in constant change? How can we make it our competitive advantage? How can we make it our strength, our habit, our mindset, our muscle, something that we bring to the world? And that's why we want to give you pragmatic exercises because we lived for so long in what we call long cycles, so very predictable, slow developments that many of us lost our reinvention muscles. And it's time for us to recover those muscles. Just to illustrate, um, let me ask you something. So come back to me in the chat area. I want to ask you a question. So I grew up in the Soviet Union, um, socialist, but really direction towards communism regime, authoritarian, complete control, iron curtain. When I was applying to college um, and uh, the anticipation before the collapse would be that my government would assign me to a job. So applying to college, I already was deciding everything, um, meaning that my government would take over and give me a job assignment. I would have no choice. So I lived in a very authoritarian, uh, secular, no religion permitted, non-capitalist world. My daughter went to her first grade in Slovenia, and she's now a high schooler in the U.S. And no matter where she went to school, or compared to my school, Soviet Union versus um, former Yugoslavia versus United States, on the very first day of school, at the first, first glance, whether she was starting at five or I started at seven, no matter what society, what religion, what economic or political system, every school in the world, with few exceptions, teach exact same thing on the first day of school. So what do you think? What it is? What did you learn on the first day of school? Give me just a word or two. What is the one thing or two things? Yeah, we are looking for two things. What are two things that kids in China learn as much as they learn in the U.S. and kids in Ghana learn as much as they learn in Fila? And kids in London learn as much as they learn in Brazil. Sabine says rules. Yes, what kind of rules? Uh, Sophie says to sit silently and obey. And Elizabeth says rules as well. Yeah, A greeting. That's what they learn. Yeah, we all need to greet and play nice and be nice for each other. What else? What did you all learn on the first day, even before alphabet, even before the name of the teacher, there's something that is unspoken that you're supposed to say. And Sophie is very much on the, so the teacher is always right. That's what we also learn. Be quiet. Yeah, very important. Be quiet. Raise your hand. 
who your classmates are is what you also learn. And what else? What do we all learn, no matter what political, organizational, uh, religious, economic system we're in? Absolute majority of the world learns exact same thing. Not because the world is evil, it's because it hasn't reinvented fast enough. So you are absolutely right that the two things that everyone learns, regardless of the school, with a few exceptions of experimental schools, but over 90% of the world population right now learns two things. Shut up, sit down. Why? Because for a long time, we lived in very long cycles. The average life cycle of a company was 75 years. That meant the company really didn't need to reinvent itself that often. So uh, all you need to do is to control the person and you were learning and I was learning to sit down for 45 minutes so that I can work in the same work for 8, 10, 12 hours a day for a long career doing almost exactly the same as I do. And in a long cycle, you don't need new ideas. You just develop one idea and then you replicate it again and again, so-called cash cow years. You just keep doing the same thing. So any employees who comes and says, I have an idea, is not a helper. It's a danger to the business. So we educated the reinvention out of us. Reinvention is natural to all of us. All babies are born reinventors, but we are educated out of it because in the past, reinvention was not needed. But today, in today's world, it's a basic survival skill. So it's time for us to build our reinvention muscles. And for that, we need to understand a lot about how our biology works. What is driving our body and what is driving our mind because they're not separate. And this is where we will go to. So anytime a crisis happens, like the COVID-19 disruption or any other crisis that you experience in personal crisis, professional crisis, your body to goes to what you know from your biology courses, a fight or flight syndrome. And the fight or flight syndrome is there to protect us. There's nothing wrong with it. Fear is not your enemy. Fear is a gift. Fear is very much needed tool because the purpose of fear is to focus and redirect resources. So what happens? Imagine if 20,000 years ago, I was walking through the woods of Ohio and I heard a very loud noise. That's the disruption. That's economic crisis. That's uh, my job disappearing. That's my university putting in new requirements in the middle of the semester. That's any kind of disruption. What happens to my body? So my body triggers an automatic response, very quick response, so that my adrenaline glands above my kidneys shoot adrenaline into my brain. Yeah, into my blood. What is adrenaline doing running through the blood system? Number one, it's there to redirect all blood supply. It's trying to take all the blood that is unhelpful, unnecessary, and move it to the areas where it's necessary. And where is it necessary? Because for thousands of years, most of disruption was a physical disruption, physical threat. The area where physical threat can be felt, met with the response is our muscles, right? So what does our body do? It takes blood out of our brain and out of our digestion and moves it to our hands and to our feet so that we can kill the enemy or run away from the enemy. That's fight or flight. Kill the crisis or run away from the crisis. In addition to blood distribution, so adrenaline actually makes the blood supply in our brain smaller. It squeezes the arteries so that that blood goes into a new direction. In addition to the brain being deprived of blood and oxygen, our eyes are no longer able to see the big picture. Literally, the parts of our eyes that are looking at the periphery, everything that is here, uh, sending the signal, but the brain no longer records that signal. That's what's called tunnel vision. Our ears are directed to only record the sounds that are connected to the danger. It's called auditory exclusion. Our ears literally cannot hear. Our hearts start beating faster so that the blood pushes further into the fingers and the muscles. 
our blood pressure goes up so that we get more blood into places where it's needed. The whole body changes. So next time you're experiencing any kind of disruption, even if it's just your family telling you something you don't like, notice what your body is doing. It's not doing it because it's stupid or it's your enemy. It's actually trying to protect you. It's trying to mobilize the resource and trying to focus your attention, direct your hearing. But if you're sitting with a team of your fellow pirates and you're proposing a new idea for your startup and the rest of the team is freaking out or saying, no, you are this bad idea and you're not, no, not going to support you. And their hearts are pumping and their, you know, their whole, uh, you can see that they're agitated. It's not because they're stupid. It's because their body is trying to protect them. They literally cannot think. They literally have no oxygen. They're not stupid. They just have no oxygen in their brain and they cannot hear you and they cannot fully see what you're proposing. So the question is, what do we do with all of it? Well, bad news, this is automatic. So all of you, I assume, are drivers, right? So if you're a driver, put a plus into the comments. If you're a driver, give me a plus. I assume more of, most of you are drivers. If you're a driver, put a plus. Good, I see some pluses, Selena's plus, Cara, Sabina's plus. Okay, most of you are drivers, great. So the, all of you who are drivers, remember the last time you were sitting in the passenger seat and the driver was doing something crazy. Remember that time? You're sitting in the passenger seat and the driver is doing something crazy. What is your right foot doing? When that is happening, what is your right foot doing? Celine says pushing. Kara says trying to break. Yeah. Ella says going forward. That's your right foot. Trampling. Yeah. Shaking a little bit. Yeah. So those of you who remember this sensation, screaming, says Jean, my right foot is screaming. I'm saying, ah, yeah. Your right foot will start breaking uncontrollably, not because you're a small, stupid person. No. When you sat in that car, that happens to me the same. I know all of this biology. I sat in the car. I looked down. I knew, my brain knew that there is no break there. But my body will try to break anyway because my bodily response is much faster than my brain, about 500 times faster. So next time you're proposing an idea to your team and you're expecting them to say, yay, you are the smartest guy ever. And in, in the reaction, they actually sit in there and they're not supporting your idea. Remember, it's not that they're not supporting, just their body's normal response to any kind of change is fight or flight. That's bad news. Bad news, we have no control over it. Good news, for the average human being, from the moment adrenaline hits our blood to the moment it starts cleaning up through our kidneys is about 90 seconds. That's all. The first 90 seconds, you have no choice. Like that foot that is breaking, you have no choice. You have to break. Your body will break for you. So the first 90 seconds, not you, not your team members, not your mom, who you're proposing something to, and she's like, absolutely not. She has no choice. The first 90 seconds, we have no choice. But after the 90 seconds, we can choose. And what are we choosing between? We can choose to start a new cycle in our head, and then we can stay in those 90 seconds for the next 90 years. I know people who are still angry and upset about something that happened nine years ago, let alone 90 seconds ago. But we can also choose an alternative direction. And that's what exercise today is about. Giving ourselves the 90 seconds to be angry and upset and scared, and then choosing how to direct those feelings, those emotions, how to use that fear to create productive actions because your body just spent all this amazing resources, right? Very important resources to mobilize itself. Why waste it? Let's move it on. But important thing, you cannot move on until you give yourself those 90 seconds. So I told you already, my daughter is 16. You can imagine your teenage years. Some of you are still teenagers. So she comes home from school and, you know, high school drama, everything you see on TV about American high school is true. So she comes all upset and angry. 
and I'm standing in the kitchen and I start giving her rational ideas of how to solve the problem. And she looks at me and she says, mom, give me my 90 seconds. What she's telling me is that all of us need our 90 seconds. Don't try to pretend, don't try to squash them, don't try to glance over them. Give yourself, give your team 90 seconds to be angry and upset and then mobilize it. And that's what this rule is about. Give your seconds. And if your team, if yourself, if your classmates, if your family is freaking out when crisis is there, congratulations, they're normal. If they were not freaking out, I would think that there's some mental disease going on. So if you're freaking out in the times of crisis, great, congratulations, you are healthy. If your team is freaking out, if your classmates are freaking out, if your parents are freaking out, congratulations, they are healthy. Give them 90 seconds, give yourself 90 seconds, congratulate that you're normal and healthy and only then move on to the exercise. So this is what we will do now is not to suppress your flight or fight syndrome, not to fight our emotions, but rather appreciate them and mobilize them and use them as a resource. So this is the worksheet we prepared uh, two months ago for a forum we hosted called Reinventing in a Time of Crisis. And I wanna give you this worksheet as a link. So I will put it in the chat. And if you cannot download it, we will also send it uh, through Marco so you can all get it. Uh, once you download it, give me a plus. I will walk you through this exercise and we will make sure that you can do it. So once it's downloaded, once you open, it's just a three-page, four-page PDF. Uh, make sure that you put a plus and then I will start walking you through this exercise. It's very simple, but we've done it now for literally thousands of people of all ages and all industries. And it's been an amazing, an amazing source. So to download, oh, sorry, I need to give it to all of you. To download, just go to this link. And once you got it, give me a plus. It's a short PDF and I will just walk you through it. And I hope you do it already today and don't delay it. So if you got it, if you have the PDF, you have a plus. Good, good. So a few of you already downloaded. That means it's working. The link is there. Good, 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 good. So this exercise has only three steps, but the sequence is very, very important because of our biology. We designed it for the biological response. So please don't skip over. So the whole idea is to make sure that we don't move to rational too quickly, that we give each other the 90 seconds. Give me my 90 seconds is the rule of the game. So the first step is not to pretend that fear is not there, but actually mobilize the fear. So step number one is to list all the fears and to understand deeply why are we afraid of what are we afraid of. So on the left side, you write your fear. On the right side, you write the potential impact. What happens if this fear actually comes to be, if my fear materializes? And what you will notice, perhaps, as you will list your fears, is that you may be not having 10 fears. Maybe you just use two different fears but you give them all different names and you will realize that you are not really that afraid, that it just in our head, we're not linear. And the moment we put it in a sequential linear fashion, we're able to uh, really face our fear in a full sense. Yeah, that's step number one. Once you listed your fears and you understood the impact, the second step is for you to sort all your fears into three categories. Category number one, the red circle, and you can just put it in numbers. So on the first worksheet, you just put it in numbers, and here you can sort it in, put in numbers in the circles. The first circle is, what can I directly control? Uh, for example, if I'm afraid that I will miss this workshop, that fear is easy to control because I can put five reminders and get my secretary to remind extra and ask Marco to actually remind me again. So uh, what can I directly control? The blue bucket is what can I influence? And the black bucket is what's outside of my control. For example, my state is still under quarantine. I don't know when it will open up, maybe May 12th. That's outside of my control. The actual date that I'm allowed to do something is outside of my control. The important thing here, once we're sorting, 
is to make sure we understand what is the level of control we have over something we're afraid of. And we have to commit very honestly from now on that we will not spend more than 20% of our time, attention, and discussion in the black bucket. Things that we cannot control. Because if we spend too much time in things that we cannot control, our ability to increase our influence actually shrinks because all of our energy, all of our resources, all of the things we control actually moves towards things we have zero influence over. We're just sitting there and freaking out and bitching about things that we can no control. So the rule is create the clarity, sort your fears out and commit to yourself, to your friends that you, even if you're meeting for dinner, you will not spend the whole dinner discussing things you cannot control. That's just a waste of everyone's energy and it's an increase in fear. It's staying in those 90 seconds forever. We need to move out. So that's step number two. And step number three, you create a clear plan of action only for items that are in your red and blue bucket. Only around things you can influence or things you can control. And you create a very clear plan of action, what you're going to do to manage those fears, to manage the situation and use your fear productively. If you promise to do this exercise today or tomorrow, I guarantee you will be surprised. So I would love to hear either on, a, uh, on the Pirates Facebook page or somehow else how this went and what did you do. If you can just, uh, you can also share this exercise with anyone. It's, it's not a requirement. And um, I would love to, if you tag me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, I would love to also comment on your exercise as well. So I know many of you are working in teams, whether it's in classroom or your startup or anything else. Of course, you can do this virtually. So the two tools we use are Trello and Miro. Both of them are free. You can see on Trello, you can use the column. So you can pull all fears into one first column and then drag the cards into can control, can influence, or out of control. Or on Miro, you can actually do it as a, a virtual post-it note. So each person of the team can put their fears and then drag them into different buckets. You don't need to be physically connected. But if you do this, I guarantee you will discover something, you will surprise yourself, and you will feel much more empowered at the end. So I'll stop right now. And I would love to answer your questions and uh, see if you promise that you will try this exercise in the next 48 hours. If you promise, give me a plus. Make a commitment to yourself because everyone who actually did it, you know, reinvention is not a spectator sport. You cannot build your reinvention muscles by watching me speak about it. Just the way you cannot build your physical muscle by watching somebody else do push-ups. You actually have to get off the couch and do push-ups. And this is where here. So I see Zeno says plus, there's a promise. Sophie says plus, give me a promise that you will do this exercise at least in the next 48 hours. And I'm sure you will surprise yourself. Caro gives me a plus. Uh, Sophie says, don't stop. You're so positive. Uh, we are wrapping up. So I love you guys. You can stay connected. I'm on all social media, so I'm not going anywhere. We'll make sure. Uh, uh, thanks for pushing. Joanna says a plus. Matthias says plus. Stefan says plus. Yes, we need commitment. Okay, remember, none of it is a spectator sport. We cannot just sit on the couch. We have to do things. That's all there is to anything in life. It's just freaking do it. So... Uh, please do it. Marco, go ahead and give it to you. Super. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, you also get the plus from me. Yes. Ah, good. <laughs> I want to see those exercises done. Yes. Thank you very much, Nadia. That was really, really interesting also to get, you know, this, this background information when we talk about fear. Um, well, there was one thing when you were talking about this 90 seconds, uh, 90 seconds uh, rule. Uh, you know, there's this saying, if, you don't, if your dreams don't scare you, they are not big enough. So I think there's, they are somehow connected. There's some truth to that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I want to deliver to all of us, fear gets a bad rap. Fear gets a bad PR. There is a, fear has a bad brand. It has a branding issue. So we need to rebrand fear. Fear is a beautiful, very needed response. If we didn't have fear, we would die. It's there to protect us. So instead of fighting it, let's respect it, let's honor it, and then let's use it. Your body just spent tons of resources. Imagine, 
getting your blood pressure up, getting your heart rate up, pushing all of these things, but your body just got hot and excited and now you're going to waste all of that energy? No, let's use it up and let's rebrand fear as something that is working for us, not against us. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, first of all, to all the attendees here, uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the chat or the Q&A tool. We're uh, not as happy to answer them. Uh, but to, to, f to follow up uh, to what you just said, you know, thinking about this topic of mindfulness, uh, uh, it's, it's also, uh, with the Moonshot Pirates, it's also a very important topic. And um, the way, we, when you think about fear, fear is just, you know, anticipating something in the future which is not even existing yet, it's not even happening, but it's just in our heads, you know. Um, if you realize that, it, it's actually so much easier to, 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 to handle those situations. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I have actually one question. Um, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned it, uh, actually I was surprised you said uh, you would dedicate 20% of your time to the black bucket. Mm -hmm. Why would you dedicate any time at all to that? It's a very important question, crucial question. The reason why it's not 100 to 0, but you need to spend 10 to 20, I wouldn't spend any less than 10, because we need to be anticipating change long before it happens. So we need to have our ear to the ground, right? For example, I cannot control, I work a lot in international markets and for me, currency exchange rates are important, but I cannot influence them. I have zero control over, I'm not that powerful in the world to control the currency exchange, but I need to pay attention to them. I need to know where they are. I need to understand the trends. I need to be able to notice things, especially now when we're living in the age of exponential rate. So you all read the articles about exponential era where things change much faster and they change the exponential math forms, which means that something that was very small today because of exponential growth in a very short period of time can become a big problem or big opportunity. I need to have my ear to the ground. I need to learn how to trend watch and trend watching in our, this, behind me, I just had a lecture on reinvention as a system and number one pillar in reinvention as a system is anticipating change. If you want to be good at anticipating change, you need to hear things you don't want to hear. You need to notice trends you don't want to look into the eye. You need to see. So it's a great, great question. And it's a whole um, dimension. It's a whole skill that is growing. Anticipating change, trend watching is becoming very crucial today. Okay, can I can I f uh, add another question to that? Yeah. Um, you know, talking about the glo global things, all the all the stuff that's happening. Our source of, of news are usually different kinds of media. Who may may watch I don't know. Maybe watching news or newspapers, whatever. What is your take on that? I mean, uh, many people say uh, avoid news because it's only negative and it's gonna just make you feel miserable. Well, what do you think about that? It's all about the number, the, the volume, right? So it, that's why we're talking about 10 or 20% of your energy. Um, I don't think it's realistic or healthy to avoid real world. Facts are friendly. But the problem is that me, like everyone else, I get on the phone and I stay on the phone for hours. And I thought I will read the news. I will scan for 10, 15 minutes and then two hours I'll past and I'm still not sleeping, reading some crazy review. So uh, how I solved that is I created a, a wonderful community and in Facebook or any social media is uh, automatically doing that because it creates a cocoon of, a, uh, of a, the algorithm only shows you a particular small fraction of the news. But you can do it in a different way uh, that you get a couple of sources of news that you trust you read them, scan them very quickly, and you move on. For example, for me, an aggregator like Skimmed, I don't know if you know this startup, it's an American startup. Skimmed, it's like skimming the, mm -hmm. the, the cream of the milk. It's just a short one paragraph summary. And because I trust the source and I see what they select day after day, I like their source, but you can find any other aggregator you like, or you can aggregate yourself. You can uh, um, just follow five people do, who you think are good, give yourself a limit and be very disciplined not to go over. So for me, what we do in our family now, we actually turn off the phone every 
few hours. Uh, everyone needs to put the phone down in one area for a few hours that we do not do not and uh, move it. And also on my laptop, there is an app. I have a Mac. So for Mac specifically, there's a free app called Self Control. I can actually limit how many hours I am and I can block certain sites and no matter what I do, it will not open. So when I am losing self-control, I actually make sure that I cannot open a single website so I don't get um, in trouble. I like the irony behind it. So there's an app called self-control. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's all. I mean, I have no self-control, so I have to outsource it. That's what it is. Okay. But uh, there are different ways you can approach it. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, finding a healthy balance. And the healthy balance that we know from research is somewhere 10 to 20% of your attention going to things you cannot control mm -hmm. and not allowing any more. Because the more you allow it, the more it sucks the energy out of you. Uh, somebody asked, Ella asked, can you explain the 90 seconds rule again? So let me, uh, let me explain. So chemically speaking, the first 90 seconds from the moment adrenaline hits your body, you have no choice. So the 90 second rule says that you must give yourself, your team, your community time to be very upset and very angry and not rush it and not to pretend that it's not there. That's all that rule says, that the first 90 seconds, and for some people, it's not really 90 seconds, a couple of hours, you really cannot control it. You have to be, if those of you, for example, my mom had cancer. Those of you who worked with cancer patients, you may know that every cancer patient is allowed to be very upset once a day because you freaking hate it. <laughs> there is no way to spin it positively. So you need to give yourself an outlet to feel the emotion. And what happens a lot in business and not only in business and politics, we try to pretend that the emotion is not there. So a CEO announces a big program and they walk in into the employee meeting with this fancy presentation that says this beautiful new project is starting and the whole group is like, crap, I hate this. So giving people a chance to be very upset and angry, not squandering the emotion is what 90 second rule is about. Giving my daughter 90 seconds to be angry, not to move on to the rational solution too quickly because we need, it's uncontrollable, it's biologically predisposed. You cannot squander it. The only thing you will do if you try to jump to the end of 90 seconds too quickly, you will create silence. The flight will happen here, the fight or flight. People will disappear right here. They will stop talking to you. They will pretend that they are listening, but they're still living that emotion. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Matthias is asking a question actually um, in the Q&A. Uh, besides using fear to reflect on my behavior, what other techniques or tools can I use to find my blind spots? Mm -hmm. Um, I use a lot of appreciative inquiry. It's a particular school of thought uh, in the change management field. I will just type it up here. Uh, appreciative inquiry is a particular way to analyze what needs to be changed. But unlike the traditional tools, which analyze what's not working. So even Matthias, he's speaking about blind spots. Uh, instead of analyzing what's not working, so for example, um, you are not sleeping. <laughs> Just for the last few couple of weeks, you stop sleeping well. Instead of analyzing every night that you are not sleeping and trying to figure out what it was, did you watch too much Netflix? Or did you drink? Or did you not drink? Or whatever else is the reason you're not sleeping? you start analyzing days you were sleeping in the same period of time. And you try to figure out what worked rather than what didn't work. We use it a lot with business. For example, we worked with British Airways many, many years ago when they were losing a lot of luggage. And they would do this crazy amount of project analyzing every time they lost luggage. They had a catalog. They literally were the best people in the world to figure out the most creative ways to lose your passenger luggage. The problem is that didn't tell them anything about how not to lose it. And when we started the analysis, we said, let's analyze every instance you should have lost luggage. So it was a strike. It was a volcano. It was a tornado. It was something else. You should have lost luggage, but you didn't. Why didn't you? What went right? And that's what I would use as a tool also to see what you are not noticing. Because we are taught, remember, 
in our kids, in, in our, um, when we're growing up, we are taught to pay attention to problems. We are problem solvers. Uh, we are taught to uh, really, really dig in on things that are not working, even in the product development. Those of you with Moonshot Pirates and when you went to camp and started thinking about product development, remember what we start with, customer pains. We go into the negative, but we don't spend enough time understanding when did that pain look like a solution? When did the solution look like? What did it look like? How did they solve it? And can we jump off that to find our blind spot? That's brilliant. It's a sure. very, very inter interesting approach. Sure. Um, I have a big request. Yes. Uh, every two years, we as a global community, we is uh, the community is called Chief Reinvention Officer. And the idea of this community is to make sure that each one of us becomes like a pirate, becomes Chief Reinvention Officer of our life. We do global research. And this research helps us understand how quickly companies and organizations and communities are changing, how successful they are. There. And we just started our 2020 research. The survey takes four minutes to complete. It's anonymous. We don't collect your email, none of that. And I would love to get a voice of youth in that, especially if you could answer this from the perspective of organizations you were part of. For example, if you're a student now, you can speak about your university or your school. How fast is it reinventing? And have you noticed any changes in the way your school work? And so if you are already in a startup, if you are anywhere else, I would love, love, love your opinion because we always get a huge influx. So last time it was 2,500. I think out of that, less than 100 were under age 20. So I would love a younger voice in this survey. And Sabine says, send the link here. Here's the link. It will take you four minutes to complete, no longer at all, and answer from a perspective of organization you belong to right now. So if it's a school, then it's a school. If you're already working, then that organization, anything. If you're a startup, if you're part of a nonprofit community, if you are just an individual, that's also fine. You can think about yourself as an entity. Thank you guys in advance. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. I think many here are happy to do that. Um, well, I, th I think there are no more questions. So um, I think you did a pretty, pretty good job <laughs> explaining yeah. well. No, seriously, I, I think it was, a, it was a brilliant webinar. Uh, I very much enjoyed listening to you and it's very interesting to see this different perspective on fear. Um, so I would like to thank you for, for taking your time, for, for spending your, 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 your precious time with us. Uh, thank you for, you know, I mean, joining us from Ohio. Um, I hope it's going to be less than seven years until we meet again <laughs> uh, for, the, for the next, for the next uh, encounter or for the, for the next meeting. Uh, also, thank you everyone for, for joining, uh, all the listeners, all the attendees, and also for, um, you know, for participating for this very interactive session. Um, for those of you who are between 15 and 19, we, you might have heard the news. Uh, Nadia mentioned it already in her webinar. Big challenge. <laughs> the, the Be a Pirate Challenge, uh, where we give you the chance in three weeks to develop your own idea and the best idea will actually fly to the Silicon Valley and have the chance to, you know, discover the way of work and life in the Silicon Valley in San Francisco. So it's a really, really cool opportunity. Just go on uh, moonshotparts.com slash challenge and apply or register. It's not a big application. And uh, yeah, we would, we would be delighted to have you there. You're not gonna regret it. It's uh, really with amazing mentors and speakers from all around the world who are supporting you. Um, anything else? Uh, yeah, of course, follow us on Instagram. We're happy to hear your feedback. Uh, about this webinar, about the webinars in general, uh, write us on, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, via email. Tomorrow we have another uh, webinar, uh, and Nadia, you know him, Nikki Ernst. Oh, Nikki is uh, wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Um, he's a very dear friend, and uh, he's going to talk about the seven skills of social intelligence. Um, so um, I'm very much looking forward to that one. Also, we recorded the video today. Uh, it's going to be published together with a blog post. Kaya is going to write a blog post about it. Yay. And uh, yeah, so thank that you. Is, that's basically it. Um, Nadia, once again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. 
And, and it will be less than seven years, for sure. So. <laughs> I'm going to do my part. So uh, Me too. I will do my part. <laughs> Hugs to everyone. Thank you, everyone, for Thank joining. Thank you very much. Take and care. I can't wait to hear what you do with your fear. It's on our side. It's all for us. So. Fantastic. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.